So today, <clears throat> I will continue discussing uh, uh, time-dependent perturbation theory. Uh, and uh, <clears throat> I will, uh, so we will see something that you know very well, but that is, uh, then we will study an example of uh, interaction of external radiation with an atom. So we'll see how uh, an atom is absorbed, is able to absorb external radiation or to emit, okay? And we will find things that you already know, okay? So atoms are able to absorb uh, uh, radiation only when uh, frequencies are uh, chosen properly such that the, you should match uh, uh, the energy difference divided by h bar between uh, two atoms, uh, two levels of the atom. Moreover, uh, depending uh, on certain selection rule, you may have these transitions allowed or forbidden. Okay, so these are all things that you know. The only thing we are going to do is just to find out all these. Uh, using the tools that we learned so far, okay? So let me um, start uh, by making a very brief recap of what we learned so far, okay? But in a very simple terms. I mean, of course, I cannot go through all the through all the expression, but uh, so let me let me just stress a few things about time dependent perturbation theory. So the problem that we had to, to deal with was to have uh, 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 to find approximate solution of the time dependent perturbation theory. And the idea was the following. We had something like uh, an Hamiltonian, which was expressed in this form, H zero plus lambda V. Uh, and uh, we were interested in uh, studying uh, the, uh, the dynamics, the property the dynamics of the system. And uh, with the assumption that we knew the properties, say the dynamics generated by H zero, and, uh, but it is not possible to study the, the full dynamics. I mean, we can do numerical simulation, but say analytically, we don't know how to deal with it, but what we know is that this term can be treated as a perturbation. Okay, sorry, uh, just a moment, I have to just answer the phone and then I will, uh, I will just give me two seconds because I, otherwise I, I do not hear. Sorry, I forgot to switch off the phone. Uh, sorry, I switched off the, the phone. I, I forgot to do. I forgot to do it before. Now, uh, okay. So, um, so what does it mean to treat it, uh, this as a perturbation? It meant that uh, the wave function psi of t as a function of time was expressed in terms of this coefficient cn of t e to the minus e zero n of t times phi zero n. So it was chosen, we chose to use this as a basis, the h zero as a basis to express 
um, the evolution uh, when only H0 was present. And then uh, the perturbation was uh, related to uh, an approximate solution for these coefficients, okay? So Cn of t was constructed, let's say, I just write it in general without specifying uh, uh, more, uh, was expressed in terms of a power series of the interaction lambda. Hmm? So <clears throat> I stress it once more. The good thing, uh, so in principle, you can use you can use any solution, uh, any representation of the the wave function psi. So you can use any basis. The good thing of using the basis of phi zero n, so the basis of the eigenstate of H zero is that everything becomes much, much simpler when uh, uh, constructing a series of equation to determine uh, this coefficient. In fact, what we saw is that the coefficient for C zero is very simple. It just says, says that when lambda is equal to zero, C zero is time independent. It's just fixed by uh, what uh, it was defined before, uh, sorry, in the initial wave function. So it's time independent. But then the nice thing was that when you, we do, uh, we do write all the equation uh, at each order of perturbation theory. The equation for the uh, nth coefficient or qth coefficient, n is used for difference, okay? So lambda to the power q, the derivative of this coefficient with time just depends only on q minus one, okay? So you have recursive way to construct the uh, the solution step by step, okay? Now, something that you should keep always in mind is the fact that uh, if you apply, when you apply perturbation theory, once you find the result, you should verify that the result that you find fulfills all the approximations that were uh, explicit or implicit in doing perturbation theory, okay? So each term of perturbation theory, the word says, should be small as compared to the previous one, okay? So perturbation works when the corrections are, at any order, are smaller than the, the previous order, okay? So this is something that you should keep in mind. So when you do some calculation in perturbation theory, Afterwards, you should verify that what you find is consistent with the initial with the initial hypothesis. And so the expression that you might find is only valid in certain regime, okay? And it is important that case by case, you determine the regime where perturbation theory is valid. Now, something that we did um, in the last, um, Two lectures was first of all what we study was the probability the transition probability to go from state i to the state n as a function of time okay when uh, uh, you apply time uh, dependent perturbation okay and something that for instance we learn is that uh, when you apply ad adiabatic perturbation, so very slow perturbation in time, uh, then uh, uh, transitions are not induced, okay? So the system, if, all, if it, the system was prepared in the initial state of the Hamiltonian H0, it will remain in that, in that state. Now, the adiabatic approximation is something we are going to study again um, in the in the next in the next lecture. Now, uh, yesterday, but something important that we saw is that when we study 
um, periodic perturbation then this p this transition probabilities have uh, a kind of resonance behavior so they are greatly enhanced when the frequency of the perturbation matches the frequency of um, uh, of uh, some energy difference in the some natural frequency of the system meaning the difference in energies of uh, between two different levels uh, just keeping in mind that i'm just saying frequency and energy and i just keep it at the same level because i keep using h bar equal to one last uh, yesterday no sorry tuesday the last thing we did was to derive what is known as the fermi golden rule Uh, so that was to consider the rate, the transition rate, okay? The transition rate is nothing else than the probability, so between I and N, is the probability to go from the, the state I to the state N per unit time, okay? So it's just uh, this probability uh, co considering, uh, say, t going to infinity. Okay. And what we found was uh, what is known as Fermi Golden Rule, that is, says that this transition rate is nothing else than, and here I just put h bar just because uh, this is a celebrated formula. That is 2 pi over h bar. Then you have a matrix element square. And then you have a delta function of uh, E0 n minus E0 e minus h bar omega. OK? So this is the Fermi Golder. Now, uh, today we are going to study uh, an important case, uh, meaning we are going to study, uh, study the interaction of electromagnetic radiation on an atom. Okay, so essentially we are going to apply all these concepts and uh, result to a specific case, um, which is very important. So you will see that uh, many things that we are going to derive now, you already know, okay? We simply just do it uh, using uh, the formalism of uh, perturbation theory. So chapter of, uh, of today's lecture is electromagnetic radiation on an atom, okay? Okay, now, uh, we will assume that uh, the electromagnetic field can be treated classically, okay? So you know very well that you know, electromagnetic is, uh, uh, I mean, the radiation is made of, uh, so light is photons, but uh, for the discussion here, we are just assuming that we are in a regime in which the intensity of the uh, of the field uh, is such that uh, the, the electromagnetic field can be treated as uh, classical, uh, can be treated classically. 
Okay. So um, it means that so we have uh, a region, the region in which the atom is present, where there is a vector potential which is different from zero, and uh, it's just uh, a wave. Okay, so it's periodic in space and time. And we just write it in this form. So we just have some uh, amplitude, and then we have a k dot r minus omega t plus complex conjugate. So it's complex conjugate because it's it's not an operator, it's just a function. And uh, just to keep... Professor? Yes? Is that a zero or a dot? Uh, this one? This one? Uh, yeah, it's a zero or a dot? E. A, a zero, this is the zero. vector. Okay, thank you. So this, uh, okay, sorry. Just made it. Uh, I, I thought it's a dot product, so... Ah, no, 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 it's a zero. So it's just uh, is the amplitude of the field times and then there is uh, uh, just um, the, the wave like uh, the, the waves in uh, the ondulatory term, which is in space and time. Okay. Just just a moment. Uh, yes. Um, so uh, it is very common, but it's not necessary, but it's customary and very um, uh, convenient to choose what is known as the Coulomb gauge. You know that you have a freedom to choose uh, a gauge uh, in which you can put phi equal to zero and also the divergence of A is equal to zero. Now, uh, once you know the vector potential, then uh, what you need to know is to, you, I mean, what you can do is just to compute from the vector potential, the, electro, the electric field and the magnetic field, okay? So what is the relation between the electric field and the vector potential? This is a question for you. Hello? Hi, are you there? Uh, yes, the magnetic field is a gradient cross uh, uh, not a. the gradient, it's a curve, okay? Oh, yeah, curl. Yeah, I mean, sorry. It's cross. It's cross. It's cross. With a. And the electric and, uh, field is what? It's the, I think, minus d phi dt. So uh, phi is zero. So we choose phi is... Oh, phi is zero and... Uh, ah, no, no. So, the, uh, yeah. So it's one over c d dt of a. Yeah, the a dt. Yes. The ADT, and then there is minus E phi, okay? Yeah. So the, the, the gradient of phi. But we, we just take uh, only this, this term, right? Is, is, it, is it clear? I mean, uh, I'm talking to the others. Are you with me or are you lost? Yes, uh, I'm with you. Very it's good. Clear. Very good. Okay. So in the next, uh, so I mean, I have to make a choice of this a zero, and just just to keep the thing clear, I just make the choice that a zero as a vector is in the z direction. Okay. So I just take uh, this vector to be in the z direction, and. Um, 
and it's uh, propagating in the y direction. Okay. So this is a transfer. Uh, you know that the electromagnetic field, uh, electromagnetic wave are uh, uh, transfers wave. So you have that the uh, the field. Uh, along uh, so the electro electric and magnetic field uh, oscillate perpendicular to the direction of propagation and they will and they are uh, orthogonal among themselves so something that you should do is once i give you this then uh, you should compute you, you do it yourself okay you should compute this uh, to uh, you should compute both the electromagnetic, uh, the electric field, and, uh, and the magnetic field. Okay. And then, in this way, you will be able to express uh, what is the amplitude of the electric and the magnetic field in terms of a zero. Hmm? Okay. So this you do it yourself. Say yes. Some of you should say yes. Yes. Okay. Very good. Professor. So, yes. Sorry. Uh, in the the the, ev the ev vectors, the CC is just like a constant. Or? No, CC is complex conjugate. Oh. Okay. 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 So, with, in this particular case, means that if I take a zero like some num, I mean, a zero times z, and you just take a complex conjugate, if you take a zero to be real, this is nothing else than a stationary wave, because it's a cosine. Right? Yes. So you just take a real, okay? A zero real. This is equal to a zero z cosine of we just said k y minus omega t okay this is k okay where is the sign part sorry where is your sign part I don't hear you. So oh, can you repeat? Um, I ask, uh, uh, I just see the cosine part. Where is your sine part? Oh, this is a choice. I'm just taking in such a way to be, a, a, if I have a, a zero real, uh, this plus the complex conjugate is just a cosine. Where, where do you want to see the sign? I thought this should be cosine plus the I sign. Uh, sorry, perhaps I don't understand. Let, let me repeat this way, now. okay? So if I have E, E zero, E to the I, K, Y minus omega T, plus complex conjugate means A zero. So I have one half a zero e to the minus i k y minus omega t. This is equal to a zero is real, so it goes out yeah. times Constant. one half e to the i k y minus omega t plus e to the minus i k y minus omega t, which is equal to a zero cosine of k y minus omega t. Okay. Yes. So there is no sign. Uh, I think because of the complex conjugate, but it's because of the ah, complex conjugate. Yeah, I see. Yes. I see it. So the sign, uh, the sign enters with the. So this is cosine plus i sine. And this is cosine minus i sine. So the sine simplify. Yes. 
Is it okay now? Uh, sorry, is it okay now? I do, I do not hear. Yes, uh, it's okay now. Okay. Okay, very good. So you determine, but this is, uh, you determine the, the value of E and B, okay? So now the, this is the, so you see, this is the periodic perturbation, okay? Uh, I stress and remind you that uh, do you remember that when we discuss cases in which there was a periodic perturbation we had that had both, both positive and negative uh, components, there was always a term which was much more relevant when the frequency was close to a resonance frequency. That is the rotating and counter rotating terms, okay? So keeping in mind, this is the situation here. So we should uh, uh, remember this. Now, the next thing, so we should write down is the Hamiltonian of the atom. So let's consider hydrogen atom, the, uh, the, uh, the Hamiltonian of the atom in the presence of an electromagnetic field, okay? So I'm hearing you. So if I ask you, can you tell me what should I write? Uh, so what is the Hamiltonian of an hydrogen atom in the presence of uh, an electromagnetic field? Go ahead. Um, momentum plus. Um... No, yeah. So what should I write? Tell me step by step. So kinetic energy is one over two M. One over two M times yeah. the momentum plus charge time the potential a squared so it's p plus q e a over c a e over c a square and uh, then i have a coulomb repulsion uh, yeah. sorry not repulsion coulomb interaction between uh, uh, electron and the proton which is minus p square over minus r. E square over r then I have another, so th there is an extra term, which is, so the, the electron has a spin. So I should have in principle another type of interaction. What is that? Spin-spin uh, interaction? No, uh, of the spin of the electron with the, the Magnetic electromagnetic field. field. So, the, it's like B time dot S. Yeah, and this is called what? Spin coupling. Uh, spin eh? orbit coupling. No. Spin is something else. It's called Zeeman. Oh. Thanks, Jonah. Is it okay? I just write it so that uh, sorry, you have Bohr magneton over H bar. Today I just put H bar uh, just to uh, so then I have B dot S. Okay. This is the Zeeman splitting. Okay. Yes, yes. I, I want to hear a couple of more cases from yes. the other. Okay. Very good. Yes. <clears throat> So let's, I just expand a little bit and I have P square over two M minus E square over R. Then I get um, E over M C A dot P plus, okay, and I, I just write it, uh, 
Uh, just a moment. Yeah, so e squared over two m c squared h a squared plus I have the Zeeman term, which is q mu b over h bar b dot s. Okay, uh, professor. Yeah, uh, is the momentum and the uh, potential uh, magnetic potential commute? Now, this is a good point, and I'm going to 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 tell you. Now you see that uh, they do not commute. So in principle, you have uh, two terms. Okay. So the the cross product should be p dot a plus a dot p, okay? And uh, they do not commute because a is a function, so does depend on x, on the, on the coordinate, on r, okay? So in terms of operators, this will be a of minus i gradient, okay? Now, <clears throat> uh, what you have to use is the commutation relation between uh, momentum and position and use the fact that we are choosing divergence of A equal to zero, okay? This means that you can bring the cross product, uh, sorry, yes, the cross product to this form in which A is on the left and P is on the right. And just notice here, there is no factor two. It's not that there is only one term, okay? You get it to this form and then you have to use, so you, you have to transform this cross product using commutation relation, okay? And the fact that the divergence of A should be equal to zero. Now, Uh, sorry. Yes. I mean, I, I get the, the point where the divergence of A equal to zero. So you delete the term P dot A, but why is the factor two is missing? You have to do the calculation. So just do it if you don't, uh, if you don't uh, get it. Oh, oh okay, okay. okay. I, I think I, I can imagine a bit. Okay. Uh, uh, by the way, something I want to say. I would like to meet you or at least way from distance in pairs or in tribals in pairs, it's okay. So please uh, let's start to fix uh, some uh, meeting meetings next week, okay? Because we should somewhat uh, just uh, have some, uh, some discussion. So try to arrange this. So for instance, we can do it uh, next week it is okay to do it monday wednesday or thursday something and i have something important to ask you tuesday i have to give a lecture to for some other for a conference uh, can you post so can we do the lectures in the afternoon uh tuesday tuesday i am not sure we should check the exam schedule because uh, Tuesday we have uh, an EPS exam, I think. Yes. What, when do you have it? It's on Tuesday, like the, the next Tuesday after, just after this week. No, no, but what time? Do you, do yeah, you know Natasha, what? Natasha said at 2, you say that at two, 2, I think. 2 p.m. Okay, so can, can you do the lecture at 4 or it's too late? Yeah, I think we can uh, have lecture after that, or even uh, in the evening, I think. <laughs> because yeah, we the evening is, uh, So oh, nice. let, let's do the following. Uh, but four, it might be okay, right? Yes, four is okay. I don't know, because... Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, so I will send, the, uh, so please the remind me, I will, uh, let's uh, check, double check also on Monday, okay? So that on Monday, we double check if four, okay, if four is okay. So I will write also to Patricia, to the secretary, just to confirm.
Okay, good. Let's go back to our problem. Now, if you see this, can you tell me what is H0? So in this H, what is H0? Uh, it's the uh, I think it's the first first two terms. Very good. So this is H0. Okay. And this is let's say lambda v, right? These three terms. Now, it turns out that not all the three terms are important, but let's say the first one is the dominant. The, the second and the third are uh, small correction. So let, let's try to estimate this, okay? So what I want to estimate is just the average over the second term, let's say two mu b h bar over b dot s over the first one. What do I mean uh, by these brackets are just uh, the, the average over the, let's say the ground state is just order of magnitude. Okay. So we just give an estimate assuming uh, typical uh, um, scale for the hydrogen atom. So what is the relation? So first of all, just notice in the numerator we have B in the denominator with A, okay? But if, let's say one question, if the amplitude is A, zero. What is the amplitude of B? Okay, can you give me an idea of the amplitude of B knowing that the amplitude of the vector potential is easy, A zero? It's A zero. No. I in, in two perpendicular directions. It's not A0, it's something else. Uh, oh, there is A0, but there is one thing which is important. I, 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 the I, cosine? No, the amplitude. So the cosine you can take is one. I'm just insisting on this because it's good just to develop some knowledge. In it's K, K, I, K. So you see that basically what you have to do is just to take the kernel. So it's a space derivative. So once you take the, the, the space derivative, you take out the K from the cosine, okay? So this means that this you can write as the, um, E H bar over MC, okay? Because I'm just writing the board magnetor, K A zero, okay? This is just an estimate and S is of the order. So S is, is the spin. So don't, don't bother about uh, eventual factors. It's not really important. The, num the denominator is just E over MC A zero and then P. So can you give me an estimate of what, what should be the, the momentum P <coughs> for uh, an hydrogen atom? Just using, uh, let's say, 
Eisenberg. Very good. So it's it will be something like H bar over A B, the Bohr radius, right? Okay. Yes. So this means that this object will be something like K A zero, uh, sorry, A bar, and K is just two pi. I just tried it. A zero, A bar, sorry, no, A zero over lambda. Now, this is very important because. So the, the electromagnetic wave is in the visible range, okay? So if the magnetic wave, uh, the electromagnetic wave is in the visible range, what is, how is lambda compared to AB? No, can, can you give me an estimate of AB? So AB is a centimeter. Is a meter. Hello? It's two kilometers. So I, I'm asking, okay. <clears throat> so I get no, an answer. In, uh, <clears throat> no, no, I just saw it uh, in the, the chat. I was uh, just waiting for the red. Very good. Is, Sorry? Oh, it's like, I think it's the comparison between angstrom and nanometer. Yeah. So then this means that. Uh, What is this ratio? So is it of the order of one or it's much smaller than one or it's much larger than one? Smaller than one. It's much smaller than one, right? So this means that if we do perturbation theory, these are a small correction as compared to, the, uh, to this term here. Now, similar analysis can be done for uh, this other term. So this other term becomes important if you apply very strong fields, okay? So if you apply, so you, you can just make an estimate, okay? just to fix what should be the electric field or magnetic field such that this term can be disregarded as compared to the previous one, okay? So of course, if you go to very, very strong fields, but this is different physics, we do not want to touch on this, then you should include this term. So just to summarize, so our perturbation theory would be something like, H zero plus E over two MC A zero. And then we have uh, E to the I K Y minus I omega T plus complex conjugate. And then I have Z dot P. Mm. 
This is my perturbation. Now, there are a few things that we should uh, keep in mind to make connection to the previous thing. Now you see that this form e to the i something plus, uh, no, this is not the region, this is complex, uh, or this complex conjugate, sorry. Um, no, this is correct. This is a region conjugate, sorry. I'm just thinking something. Um, so but there is this term here, which will have uh, both frequency, which are e to the i omega t and e to the minus i omega t. And, and then we have this term here. This, uh, this um, e to the i and the z dot p will determine the matrix elements, okay? In some way, we are going to discuss how and what, what is important, what is not important. Uh, and uh, the i omega t or minus i omega t will determine the various uh, resonant conditions. Now, can you tell me which of the two i omega t or minus i omega t will be important? Will just give rise to the resonance condition according to you. Do you remember the the the? the so I just I can go. Minus. Sorry. Um, I think the minus one. Will okay. Be right so sorry i am not able to find it so i will just discuss this okay so you see we have something similar to this omega and i plus omega or omega and i is minus omega okay now the plus or the minus depends on the fact that if we are absorbing or emitting a photon. So if the initial, so let me say the following. If the initial energy is uh, larger than the final energy, okay? This means that we are emitting a photon, okay? And so you will see that what is important, oh, I lost my, uh, just a moment, I lost wh where I was writing. I'm sorry, I, I just, I'm lost. I think this is another lecture, we should move on today. Right? Exactly, okay. but I'm not finding where did I write so far. Just give me one second because I, I'm I'm getting confused. So uh, I want to find the page where I was writing. Mm. Ah, okay. Okay. I, I did the mistake and that's okay. Yeah, I was writing. Okay. <clears throat> Sorry for this. Now basically you have e to the minus i omega, and you have a term e to the i i omega. Now, there are two possibilities. One in which i zero i is larger than i zero n. And the other one is when i zero i is smaller than i zero n. This means that the initial energy is larger than the final energy, what does it mean? Is emission or absorption of a photon, of light? Emission. Emission. This is emission process. And this is absorption, okay? 
absorption. Okay. So here, what will count is just, yeah? Professor, I is initial. Yes. Uh, N is the final. Yes. Uh, okay, thanks. So you will see that if you consider emission, then this term will be important and the other in the absorption, okay? Now, did you study the Einstein expression, Einstein formulas, Einstein relations for the uh, uh, spontaneous emission? Say no. Yes. No. no, I think no. Okay, good. Some of you know, some of you don't know. So for the moment, I mean, there th things are slightly more <clears throat> uh, complicated because one should consider also probabilities here. You will see that there are no, <clears throat> I mean, <clears throat> thermal effect and nothing of this kind. Uh, so the only difference between emission and absorption is just uh, in the in determining what what is the the resonant what, what is the term which leads to a resonant condition then we would like to further simplify and we remain uh, with this e to the ky or plus minus ky okay now since we are saying that the, the k, the k is equal to two pi over lambda, uh, lambda is much, much larger than uh, AB, the Bohr radius, then this means that in the range in which <coughs> these y are important, the coordinates are important, this can be safely taken to be one, okay? Because ky is always much smaller than one. So basically the y over which uh, we should consider this exponential are coordinate in the, in the range in which the wave function of the hydrogen atom is different from zero. And we have assuming that uh, the range, not assuming, I mean, for, for the problem we are considering, the range of extension of the wave function is much, much smaller than the wavelength of the radiation. And so we can take this exponential to one. This means that the Hamiltonian is further simplified and we just have H zero, which is the one of the hydrogen atom. And then we have E over two MC A zero. And then we have E to the I omega T plus E to the minus I omega T. And then we have Z, which is the vector, uh, the unit vector dot P. Okay. Sorry, Professor. Yes. I take you back to the up exponential IKY uh, approximating to one. This one? Yeah. Yes. Yes. Uh, are you taking your K to be much smaller or your K to be much greater than one? It's not clear to me. Okay. So. This when, so let's assume that I, I'm just putting for simplicity the, the atom at the origin of the coordinate, okay? Yes, yes. Now, the, the probability to find the electron around the origin is given by something which is the Bohr radius, okay? Mm -hmm. So I would like to have an estimate of this 
uh, exponentials up to the region in which uh, there is a probability to find the atom. Because outside, uh, I don't care about this exponential because the wave function is zero, and so I can forget it. So this means that I can say, look, but this is e to the plus minus i k a bar, which is equal to e to the plus minus two pi i a bar over lambda. But a bar over lambda, we said, uh, is much smaller than one, OK? much small, several order of magnitude uh, smaller than one. So this means that this is more or less one because this is much smaller than one. Okay? Mm, okay. Okay. Clear now? Uh, yes, it is. Okay, very good. So this is, so after some uh, approximation, then we just reduce the problem to this form. Now you see that we have all the ingredients to apply what we know, because do we know the eigenstate and eigenvalue of H zero? Yes. The form is just that. So what we call lambda V. So the, let, let, let me check uh, just a moment. Let me check the notation of that we used uh, previously. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So last time uh, we just said, look, when we study periodic perturbation, we said we just consider V times cosine of omega t. Now you see that in our case, V is nothing else than E over MC z dot p okay this is v and the cosine is exactly the rest so basically we saw that something that we have to evaluate is v n so we know the the result okay so the for the transition rate uh, we just write it okay i just rewrite it but the transition rate to go from n to, uh, sorry, from i to n as a function of t, I'm not taking the t to infinity limit, is just v n i square over 4 h bar square. And then I had the sine a squared of omega n i minus omega t over two and we get uh, omega n i minus omega over two squared times t okay so this is the formula that we had before Sorry, so professor yeah why you didn't write a zero in the expression of v? No, no, no I'm, I'm going to write it in a second. Okay. So okay. the only thing I have to, this was the general formula. The only thing I have to specify is this, what is this v n i. This v n i in our case is nothing else than, uh, ah, here you mean, here. Yes. I simply forgot. Okay. It was my mistake. It should be there. Okay. So V and I is nothing else than E A zero over M C. And then I have to compute the, uh, the matrix element between the of P Z, okay? Between uh, two different eigenfunction of the hydrogen atom, okay? Yeah. Now, yes, yeah. okay, 
So what I want to stress is that now we should get two important pieces of information. One we know already. So from this expression, we know that transition rate will become, uh, so this object will become something which of the or which is something like a delta function. So it's very narrowly, narrow peak around frequencies which are related to energy difference between two different eigenstates. Okay, so this is something you know already. It's simply we just found it in uh, within the formalism of time dependent perturbation theory. There is one extra piece of information which is very important and we still uh, we have to uh, understand how to find. This is something you also know. So you know that certain transitions are allowed and some other transition are not allowed, okay? So this extra piece of information is contained in the matrix elements V and I, okay? So the filtering of the frequency to be related to some energy differences is contained in this expression here, which eventually will lead to a, the, the delta function. As we discussed Tuesday, and we don't want to repeat this. However, there is another thing that we are going to discover that is something you already know, but we are going to discover it within uh, what we are doing now, that is, um, how to find out that certain uh, transitions are uh, allowed and certain other transitions are not allowed. Well, in order to do this, what we have to do is just to evaluate these matrix elements, okay? So in order to evaluate these matrix elements, uh, what we do is just to apply something which is a simple trick that is the following, we just do so if you compute the commutator between Z and H0, this is the commutator of Z and uh, PZ square over 2M, okay? Now, this is something because PX squared and PY square commute. So this is something you can do it. And then you find IH bar over M PZ. This means that I want to write the operator PZ as m over so minus as no that's right m over i h bar uh, z commutator which with h zero why i'm doing this well this is very simple because now i want to write the matrix element phi zero over n pz phi zero over i as uh, m over i h bar, and there are other constants that I will not report, phi zero n. Now that I have the commutator, which is um, Z H zero minus H zero Z. Okay. But you see that now it's easy to apply uh, so what i have to do is m over i h bar then you see that when i apply here i get so when i apply this term uh, i can h0 apply to phi 0 of i i will get e 0 of i minus e 0 of n hmm? and then i have uh, phi zero of n z phi 
0 of n. Right? Uh, okay. Yes. Okay. Very good. So, I mean, so in principle, you, what I want to stress is that in principle, you can do the calculation directly here, but uh, things simplify. Okay. Things simplify, uh, especially also because this is the exercise you have to do at home, but if you do it, then you will find that the electric field is nothing else than A0 omega over C, which is very simple. I re remind you that is E, the electric field was minus one over C, D, A, D, T. And so there is no more. So I am doing it for you. So when I take the derivative, uh, I just get an omega zero, uh, sorry, an omega here. Moreover, I know that since I'm close to resonance, because I want to study the resonance condition, E zero I minus E zero of N is equal to omega. Okay, so if I put everything together, then what I find is that V uh, I to N in modulus without, uh, so when I'm close to the resonance, okay? So I just put resonance here. It's something like E epsilon. Epsilon is the amplitude of the fields of the E field. Okay, mm -hmm. times, uh, I just write here, phi zero of N Z phi zero of I, okay? In modulus, so we, we, we don't care about uh, details. But now this is something, this is something very easy to be computed uh, using the, the, the wave function of the hydrogen atom and uh, this is something you have to do it actually. And then I will give you another exercise in which uh, a similar calculation should be performed. You will find out that uh, these matrix elements are different from zero when L prime, uh, so let me call it, uh, I just say, is equal to L plus minus one. So this is the state N and this is the state I, okay? And when M prime is equal to M. So these are also known as dipole transition. Okay. Uh, so first of all, uh, M prime equal to M comes from the fact that we chose. Professor. Yes. Can you, I mean, I, I have a question about the previous one, a uh, previous page. Uh, uh, Just a moment. Okay. Can I finish now and then uh, you yes, tell yes. me the question? Huh? Okay. Wait, two seconds. So, what I wanted to say that these are uh, essentially the selection rules. So, you have transition only between certain states which satisfy this constraint. Plus, you have to include resonance condition. Yes, now we go to the previous page. Where? Uh, the, the bottom one, I think. Yeah? Yeah, the, the bracket, why is it between N and N, not N and I, the last term? Because uh, it's I. You you are right. I, I was wrong. I simply wrote. Oh, sorry. I a, thought there there is something that. No, I no, 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 no. Okay. In fact, you see that here there is an I. So when I apply H zero to phi zero I, I get E zero I. Yes. When I apply this term to this, 
phi uh, just I get E zero I. Then I have minus this term here, which uh, generate E zero N, okay? And, and, I, and the matrix element is the same and I simply made a mistake in writing. Uh, after that, uh, when you, when we want to get the selection rule, should we calculate, should we expand the wave function of hydrogen atom? Yes, you the... have to use the properties of the hydrogen atom. Okay. And then you find that the, so basically when you write the Z, you can write the Z in four coordinates, okay? So you get Z equal uh, R cosine of uh, theta or something. Huh? And then you have, uh, you have to do the integral in real space. And then you have some integral, which come from the radial part, which is something. Uh, plus you have the integral between the angular components and then using the properties of the, um, the spherical harmonics, then you find that the only possibility is when uh, the angular momentum of the state N should have an L, which is plus minus uh, those depth of uh, the state I. Now, just notice that uh, in order to find M prime equal to M, uh, it should come from the fact that we, cho we chose the quantization axis equal to the, to the, the orientation of the vector, of the vector oh. potential. Okay. Okay. You, you, have, you have freedom to, to choose the quantization axis. Okay. Uh, yes. Professor, uh, can I ask you a question? Yes, but uh, um, just, you should shout. I, I don't uh, hear, I don't know, probably, yes. or you just increase the microphone uh, because mm. I do not hear well uh, what you say. Well, can, can I use the parity? Uh, um, uh, I mean, use the parity property to uh, prove this. Uh, yes, yes, rule. yes, yes, yes. So exactly, I, I just uh, wrote, the, just said the same thing in words. I mean, uh, just by doing uh, in the, 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 the actual integral, but this is actually exactly what you say. Okay. And yes. Now, um, do you have more question on this? Because then I would like to spend the last 10 minutes or 15 minutes assigning um, yes, some uh, exercise. Yes. Another you. question. Mm -hmm. So before in the, uh, you, you calculate the expectation. Uh, no, no, no. Just like the transition value, uh, transition <laughs> matrix between the, uh, so you have the PZ the, in the previous page. Uh, you have the imaginary term, right? And uh, yeah. yeah. And then in, in you you input this 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 term into the VNI. Uh, where where did the imaginary? Ah, term we for I, I just simply forget forgot because I, I first of all I should write all the coefficients and this is something you have to do it. But what I want to tell you that what is important in the transition rate is Vn i modulus squared. So the i that will not play any role. Oh, I see. So it will be like e squared uh, and then epsilon squared times the modulus. Yeah, yeah I have to take the... Uh, the modulus square of this, yes. OK. OK. I, I did not write all the coefficients. The coefficient, you, you, the, 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 the only thing which should keep in mind in order to get a nice expression and symbol expression are the following. So first of all, you have to notice that you are on resonance so you can approximate the difference in energies with omega. And this omega will simplify with this omega here. Okay, that's it. And then you will get uh, something simple. More questions? Uh, yes, you can read in the chat. Jonah is asking a question. Ah, sorry, sorry, uh, please. So you asked me a question, uh, so. Yes, 
So uh, Jonah is asking something uh, complicated. So I will give an answer. If you don't understand, uh, just forget it because this will be a part of uh, the second semester, okay? So Jonah is asking what is the connection between Green's function and Fermi Goldner rule. Now, when you have a Green's function, uh, in the presence of, so you can do perturbation theory also at the level of Green's function. And then uh, in this way, uh, what uh, you can include is to include certain processes to an infinite order in perturbation theory. Okay, so this, so you just, you have a kind of resumation to infinite order of perturbation theory of uh, certain processes. Now, here, Fel Fermi Golden Rule cor will correspond to a, um, to the determination of the self energy to single photon processes. Okay, so this is important because once you compute the transition rate, so the probability per unit time, then you're assuming that you may have several of these processes that you can sum all together and uh, you can consider all together. And this is uh, good because it's not that you are bound to consider only one of this process, but simply you're assuming that there is no coherence in the absorption between photons at two different times. If you assume this, then the probability to absorb n photons is just given by n times the probability to absorb one photons. And this is given by the Fermi Golden rule that we just computed or just do self energy at uh, at the Born approximation. Is this what you asked me? Please write me in the chat. Okay, very good. Uh, for those who do not know the Green's function, this is something you cannot follow, don't worry. Can I propose an exercise for you? Yes, yes. Very good. Uh, uh, before that, uh... What what uh, uh, what did you want to say about the uh, the square of the CNI? Is it like the probability or probability of the transition? This modulus square is the probability. No, these are the probability per unit time. So it so let me see if I find it. Do you see this Fermi Golden rule is the probability yes. per unit time. And so it's given by the modulus square of the matrix element, which tells you which matrix, which, which, which processes are allowed and which processes are not allowed. Okay. Yes, thank you. And, uh, and this gives you the, um, Um, how do you say the, the the selection in energy? Now you can verify that this is this as dimension uh, one over time. Okay, so v is energy square, h bar is energy times seconds, and this is um, the dimension of a second, uh, one over a second, and then uh, you would just put all together and then you will find it. Uh, okay. So, sorry, this is the dimension one over energy. Okay. So, you said one over energy, energy square, energy over a second, then you get one over a second as a, a dimension. Um, okay. So, now it comes the exercise that I want to give you. So at the end of the course, we will pass you the uh, some some notes that uh, 
So this goes under the name of linear Stark effect. So you have the Hamiltonian. So this is about the general perturbation theory. So you have H0, which is the hydrogen Hamiltonian. Okay. Plus A. So, uh, sorry. Plus E epsilon Z. So you just put the this hydrogen atom in a static electric field, okay? Now, I want just consider n equal one and n equal two. So just do perturbation theory and see the first order correction. So you have to determine the first order correction to professor. the energy professor yes is that uh z factor i mean z z uh no so it's z is not uh, i wanted to say uh it's an operator okay so that's oh, why okay. i put the cap but i, I just remove it so it's not even it's the operator okay okay uh, so first correct first order correction to the energy for the n equal one and n equal to now a, n equal Professor, one yes you think h not to be h minus what sorry h not you are taking it to be what there's something you have written yeah, the hydrogen atom this okay this the hydrogen okay so it's p square over 2m minus e over r So you know the, the eigenvalues and eigenfunctions. So basically, I want to know the first correction to the energy, to this level and to this level. The difference is that this level is non-degenerate. And this level, you will see that there are some degeneracy. So you have to apply the general perturbation theory. Fine. Now, if you do it, and you go fast, then try to also to compute the second order correction here. In this case, the second order correction. Only to n equal one and see if it works or not. Okay, so let, that's it. Um, I think today we can uh, finish five uh, in advance if you don't have a question if you have question please go ahead uh, so we are using time independent right time in independent yes this is static Uh, is it okay? Yes. So I just remind you that uh, the lecture on Tuesday will be in the afternoon at four, but on Monday we just uh, confirm this. So we'll, please, I, I will try to remember, but you also should remember. So have a nice lunch and a nice afternoon. Okay? Yes, thank you, Professor. Bye bye. Yes. Thank you. Goodbye. Bye. Bye. Um, guys, don't leave first. Mm -hmm. Hello. Yes. Yeah. Uh, Jonah is suggesting that we 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 uh, uh yeah, I we, think we won't we... The, the of the tutorial today. Yeah. I mean, we we that we request to move the schedule of the tutorial today so uh, what do you guys think yeah i'm i agree i agree yeah okay so this is we'll, for what sorry 
we will her. not have the uh, the uh, tutorial. tutorial. Yes, yes. I mean, we are approaching EPS. So, I mean, we, we just request this. What's with the tutorial? Uh, so we won't have this today? 